Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome. I'm happy to see uh, so many of you here. Uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, we're happy to have you here and look forward to today as well as uh, looking forward to next year, which I know Terry is going to talk about. Um, I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, Joe Sisko, and uh, there's some really interesting uh, facts about Joe. Uh, his birthday is actually coming up next week. Um, October 31st is his birthday, and um, 1919 was said when he was born, so he's actually looking really good for uh, uh, someone that was the diplomat, did a major role in the Henry Kissinger's diplomacy uh, at least. Uh, so he passed away in 2004. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to work on your digital footprint because if you other Joe, Cisco comes up first, that's not what we're talking about. Joe Cisco has been involved in education for 30 years, uh, has been a mathematics teacher, um, and we've had a really good time together for the last uh, couple days. We've got some stories that come to the doctor. Oh. Um, <laughs> Strong connection to his family, strong connection to his community, uh, strong connection to the nation. Uh, has done work with um, the ministry, works with uh, post secondary and K 12, and couldn't be prouder and happier to have you here um, to come and give us some of your knowledge. Oh, wow. Thank you. So, hey, everybody, my name's Joe. Um, I'm from yeah, Ontario, who was like yesterday. Um, yesterday day before I suppose and I got to meet a, a ton of wonderful people. Um, just to sort of give you the, uh, my sort of perception of the, of the quality of people that we met. One of the people, their, their Twitter profile that I just met this week, I'm going to make sure I have this right and read it. In their Twitter profile it says, they're delighted when kids are filled with curiosity and fun. And I just think to myself, that is pretty close to what a lot of people in the room that I've spoken with here have been like, are you kidding me? I can't believe you are so caring for these people. I was at the panel discussion yesterday for the Well Moon Festival. It was such a caring way those people came across and got congratulations. And then when the young man spoke at the end of that, well, that's exactly what he felt so important. It was brilliant. Um, I'm a wonderful sharer. So at the end of this thing, I will get your all. I will get all your email addresses today, um, and I will share. Very quickly with you of all the stuff we do today. So please don't feel that, oh my God, I missed something, whatever, right? Um, I, I'm a wonderful share. I, I, don't, I don't know if the keynote is a shared document if people are looking at that. Please continue to work with that if you do, and great if you do. Um, the third thing that sort of struck me today, which is crazy at this conference, is the amount of capacity with Google. It's like this is insane few people doing Google. And as you know, Google brings stuff up all the time. Just want to show you something I discovered maybe a, a little bit of time ago. Um, if you're in a Google Slideshow, I don't know if you have this in your domain or not. When I mouse over a Google Slideshow, I get this option to turn on closed captioning. I have an arrow that's in my domain, I guess. So I get to choose the text position, whether I want it at the top or the bottom. And I get to choose the size of the text, which is sort of cool too. So if I turn on closed captioning, what's sort of cool is, um, it starts listening to everything that I'm saying, and then it closed captions my speech or what I'm talking to in front of here. I know what you're all thinking, and this is what teachers do. Wow, I can use that in my classroom. And please understand that everything we talk about today, I'm hoping that that's the whole thing to inspire you to say, how can I do that in my classroom? And maybe I'll substitute the word I with how can the students use that in my classroom to sort of go back to the way Kathleen spoke yesterday. I love that tool, and I, just, I know your minds are spinning to say, wow, I can use that tool, absolutely, for sure. I'll turn it off because it is sort of annoying. Um, <laughs> I do understand that uh, on the road map for that, they're, they're going to they're gonna talk about having different languages in there. But, you know, in terms of our ELL population, it would be wonderful for them to practice uh, articulating their speech and so on. So the first thing I'd like to tell you to talk about is, um, I have a little list on the right hand side of what I'm going to talk about right now. And if you look at the bottom, the last one says block them up. I thought I'd just put that there to get your attention. That's the last thing I'll speak about. So if you, if you hang around, it's not a controversial topic. It might be in some, some areas. It's not what you think. Okay? So block them up is not what you think. 
This graphic you're seeing is from what they call the Minister's Student Advisory Council. So in Ontario, the minister gathers together a number of students in the province and they form a council, and every year they're sort of entrusted to make some sort of artifact. This particular group, I believe, is 2014. They made an artifact about their, their vision of the, of the future. And what struck, so I'll, I should back up for a second. The way this infographic is produced is brilliant. It's on the sides of this, this wall back here, and it sort of makes its way around the province, and certain people go and speak to it, and a lot of the times, the Ministry of Education officers and so on will bring it with them, and they'll have it in the background of speaking, and they'll speak to it to sort of validate that student voice. So what struck me is, again, picture how big this is. In the lower left-hand corner, that's what students do with technology. So there's a little thing that says technology, and all school documents and resources are online. Now I know you're online teachers, I know you have a lot of capacity. This is probably not applicable to you, but you're leaders in, the, in, in technology now. You'll be going back to your school boards, and you'll be working with people that may be good at e-learning, especially with a lot of move towards e-learning. You'll be coaching people that are going to be e-learning teachers, or just classroom teachers that are letting their learn. There are teachers in schools right now, across the world, going, they're going to the staff room and saying, oh my god, I can't believe this. I created a website, and I posted the syllabus today. And they're like the star in their school. And people are saying, show me that post syllabus. They're going to post, it's great, it's awesome, right? No kid is going home and saying, Bob and Dad, this is a teacher posted the syllabus on my today. They are not doing that, right? The kids don't care. So the teacher goes on and says, I thought the kids aren't visiting my website. What's going on? So there is a huge, huge gap to what's happening there, right? So I think of I think of when, you know, back in the day, as we say, um, I do want to show you this video. I don't know if you've seen this blockbuster video. This is really, really funny. Right? This, this, is, this is where I'm coming from. Right? So let me just play this. A new tourist destination in Auburn Hills, Michigan is showing visitors the difficulties like now for Americans in the past. Blockbuster video aims to transport visitors to a time before the internet was an historically authentic recreation of a video store, a specialty shop where customers exchanged money for a short term use of videos in an archaic system called the Lens. The truth is amazing. It's like stepping into a time machine. Certain group of people live this way. And it's one of the search teams spent 20 years making sure that every last detail was accurate. And the signs used to promote the store's merchandise to the costumes worn by the store's employees, historical performers who made history come alive for tour groups twice an hour. <laughs> All the characters based on an actual blockbuster employee who worked there from 1999 to June 2000. My main responsibility is also to man to ask for the job to take a look at the table from the trend slides back out to the shelves. I am the blockbuster customer named Captain. I get I travel six miles to rent and return videos. <laughs> <laughs> and the coffee section. This is a at this time is the uncertainty. This is a blockbuster. They're going to have to get me out. Saying, I wonder why they have that icon for the phone, the little handheld thing on the phone. 
they don't know what that is. And that's what some of the students are in terms of you know, how far we are in advance. Right? So what I'd like you to do right now is I want to sort of make sure you're part of this. If you have a device, I'm willing to give you a little a moment to do this. Can you please click on that bit.ly? Go to that bit.ly. Go bit.ly slash blended underscore space. And I would like to get you there. To, uh, to ask you a question, I suppose, and I'd like to get some feedback because um, people can do this. If you have a mobile device that may not work, you may have to do some typing. If it doesn't work in a mobile device, that's certainly fine. I'm going to pop on here just to show you what this is. Does anyone need the um, anymore? So it's bit.ly slash blended underscore space. I'm hoping the, uh, the Wi Fi can hold on this. I'll pop out there with you. So you should need a document that looks like this. Does anyone want me to put that back up again? Yes? Okay, so you're going to, excuse me, bit.ly slash blended underscore space. So I think I'm showing you this for two reasons. Um, I want to show you this for two reasons. It's to show you the, to, to get some feedback from you, you know, if you drag a sticky note on there and type away, um, drag some sticky notes on there and free work, um, I will not do what I did, but I think you get the idea. Um, whoever put that on there, thank you very much for putting that on the, on the page there. I will tell you this, I'm 54 years old and I still love seeing all the people in the document there. I think it's pretty cool that you do that. I think it's the little effort will ever change the whole collaborative mess is unbelievable. So, two reasons for doing this. Yes, I would like to get some feedback from you, but also to sort of inspire you again to say, I've never seen sort of those digital sticky notes. That's something I could use in my classroom. So again, you know, there's ways of getting feedback from students, right? This would be a wonderful way to get some feedback from students. It's incredibly easy to build. As I said earlier, I will send you some instructions on how to do this. Um, so, who's the person that needs to be on the sticky note? <laughs> you might want to press undo, but um, please feel free to do that. As I said, I still think it's pretty cool that, um, that we've got 37 people in the document. I don't know if you know the limits. We tried this once. I think we have 300 people in the document. I think we had 300 ones who blew up and stopped. But um, 300 people is pretty powerful. People that don't understand the whole collaborative piece, it's sort of the same thing over here. Um, let me go back here for a second. Back. I'm just going to add like this. Okay. Um, let me that up. Okay, so can I just speak to you about the importance of the thumbnail? So if you think about YouTube for a second, Think of how unsuccessful YouTube would have been if it was a series of links. The success of YouTube is probably based on the fact that they were, had the idea that we're going to put a little, a little thumbnail there, right? People on a mobile device now or students often will watch the little thumbnail because they don't want to commit to actually making it full screen until they actually enjoy it enough. But that thumbnail is really, really big. Think of in your courses when you embed videos in there. If you embed a video in there, the students will watch the video in the embedded spot if you want to it up. But if it's a link, I don't know, they might not be going to that link. So you think of the success of that, that really should drive sort of the design of the way we do things, right? So let me pop out and show you something. Um, sort of interesting. This is actually a person's page in Blackboard right now at the University of Wizard. Okay. It's actually a baby someone uses. So we use Blackboard University Winter, which is their LMS. Um, the reason I showed you this, and I, I, I did take one liberty. I changed the font size of this here just to sort of highlight what Sarah and Angela said in their session yesterday. Like, if we can't even make the same font size, I think we're in trouble. But let's talk about a couple of things that this teacher is doing that really sort of shows you know, an environment where it's, the kids are going to struggle through. View the video. So the kid, it's not even a hyperlink. The kid literally has to do this and then right click and go to the link. The kid is not going to the link. The kid is not going there, I think. Forgive me for saying I'm wrong, maybe I'm wrong. Again, down here, this link here, that beautiful long link, that's awesome, right? 
Again, most of you are probably a lot of proficiency in your Moodle or wherever you're using. You're making nice, pretty links that go in there. And as, as we moved through yesterday, you know, they're in line with the context of the text. They're just actually just blue words. Click here is not needed anymore. Students know not to click here. They get that. Right? They don't need that instruction for them. Um, download the PowerPoint. Classic, right? You click download. You wait for the download. You better have PowerPoint on your computer or the teacher should have figured out PowerPoint viewer and or it doesn't work. Are kids viewing that PowerPoint? No, they're not viewing that PowerPoint. Another feature of that, of course, is that it's not live. Because the next announcement is probably going to say, by the way, in the PowerPoint, change slide six to this because that was wrong. The kid's not changing slide six. They are completely out because you totally disengaged them, right? And I'm not, actually, I'm ripping on this teacher. This is horrible, right? <laughs> this is absolutely horrible. So in terms of maybe your role one day, I will, I will share the story with you. In Ontario, each board hires what they call a health contact, a technology-enabled learning and teaching contact. And one of the guys that I worked with, probably had a great idea. He would show people making announcements like this. He'd say, this is how you can make an announcement. The teacher would go, that's brutal. Right? This is really bad. And so that would be an invitation for the telecontact to work with the, with the educator to make it better. So they didn't sort of really give a beautiful LMS. They took the LMS and said, this is how what the bad version is. Let's give you the autonomy to control to make it look better. And generally, the teacher would take that, would take the lead on that, if that makes sense. Um, I guess I was working on my teacher. I'm very sorry. I shouldn't have this post. Uh, okay, let me go back for a second. So, I think to sort of transition a little bit here, I think of where the teacher is with their technology and what they're presenting to students, and then the students entering that course, right? The focus I would like to take for a little bit of time here is very simple to say that the students actually have a ton of skills. They're very comfortable with technology. They have lots of skills to do things. They can make video and audio and all that stuff. They really want to be able to demonstrate their learning to you. Please don't make me write everything all the time. That's what students would probably scream to you if they could ask. Please don't make me write all the time. And every course, if, if, if you're not careful, can become a writing course. All you're doing is assessing the students on their writing skills. And if they're not good writers, it's horrible. So I created an infographic that I'd like to show you. And I will share this with you later. Um, it's a two-page infographic, but it's, it's, it's actually just one long one. I'll share it with you later. It's, it's actually pretty navigable, too. And I share it sort of in a couple of ways, the PDF, along with the sort of interactive version. So a couple of things there. It starts, I, I'm not happy with it yet, so I'm not going to share it yet. I don't really like the title. The title is, I get it, let me show you. So think of what a way students can show their understanding of things. And I love what Catelyn said yesterday. I actually have a quote from her there. Um, so, video and audio. Students can make screencasts. Students can make podcasts. Um, students make videos all the time. You know, when, if you don't know how to make a screencast, you've never made one, go talk to some of your kids and they'll figure out how to do it. It's so simple, right? Or they'll make Instagram stories from different way. Um, visuals. Uh, infographics is actually somewhere where students might be a little bit busy, probably because they just don't are in the habit of making them, but there's a ton of infographic tools out there. Google Drawings, actually, or Google Slides can help you make infographics. Students will be able to express their understanding there, right? Mind maps are outstanding. Um, I don't know if it's MindNomo something you use out of West here. Uh, there's a whole bunch of mind mapping tools, but mind maps on a chalkboard are cool. Mind maps in a digital world can include multimedia, you know, they can include audio, video, images, links. It's the, the, the online mind mapping tools are really, really nice. Um, and sketch notes. Um, is anyone aware of what sketch notes are? Not a lot of you. Okay, I, in my sharing piece, I will share what sketch notes are. There's some great instructions about training your students to make sketch notes, and I think you'll appreciate that when you, when you get that. Um, documenting their learning, and I'll come back to this momentarily. So students can document their own learning. You think of items like, do you use CSOF on your thing? Do you portfolios, that type of stuff? So at the primary junior level, there's a lot of pedagogical documentation going on in face-to-face -face classrooms, but also it can be happening online as well, right? Um, they can build portfolios where they're doing blogs and websites. And I just added this pro tip actually from Kat yesterday. Put it on the web, right? You're gonna, it's gonna force it. I, I always like to share the story. I think of my grade four lead project. Got a Bristol board, 
made my leaves, put them on there. Think who saw my lead project. I saw it. My mom saw it because she did it. <laughs> and then my teacher saw it. And if it was any good, it was up in the wall for maybe a couple of weeks, got really dry and fell off, it was over. And it was done. You know, think of what kids can do online now that are out there sort of permanently, really empowers them to do the job on a personal to a higher level. So interesting there. Um, how am I doing so far? This is really a powerful piece to me. I'm going to show you a couple of things in a moment. Um, and students need to understand that they can get their own feedback forms when they make things. Often what happens is students push content out and that content is pushed to the teacher solely. If it is pushed to someone else, it sometimes ends there. I think it'd be brilliant if the student are pushed about, get that feedback and either incorporate it back or just at least provide some validation that whoever seen it is giving feedback, they're getting that feedback. We'll talk about that more and more. So, I'm going to talk to you about three googly things I would like you to try. So three, and there's two there, you're probably wondering, you know, Joe's a math teacher, you should be able to count. There is a third one. Um, there's three googly things I'd like you to try. So let me show you these, and I think, I think you'll like these. So going back to getting feedback, let me show you this one first. I think this is a, this is a powerful one that students can do. So the student makes a creative writing sample. It's, don't, don't bother reading through any of that, but this is the student's writing sample. And it's just, you know, again, it's published so you can push it out somewhere. A little short writing sample. But then what they do is the student is responsible for creating a form that they can gather feedback from their audience. So when they click on the form, it's peer editing 2.0 reading for me. So whoever's giving them feedback is going to fill in their first name, last name, and they're going to comment on the tone. Please choose the tone that was expressed in this writing piece. Anxious, depressed, and exciting, and so on. If the student was looking for an excited tone in their writing piece, wouldn't it be interesting if a lot of their audience actually validated that for them? Or they get it all back and say, this was really depressing. It didn't excite me at all. That's great feedback for the student. In terms of who makes these, it could be just the teacher making them start, right? Hey kids, here's a template. Use this for your feedback form, and you can all push it out and make copies. Right. As time moves on, we'll give them this vacancy and they can build it themselves. Wonderful tool of getting a lot of feedback about their own work. And again, that speaks to that whole assessment piece that happened spoke of yesterday. Certainly time saving, but incredibly effective for students to get some feedback and all that stuff. I guess that makes sense. Use this for your feedback. Go back to another piece here. So, a second piece I think you might want to try is I like to call this. Um, Redefining presentations. So I spoke with my group yesterday. Please understand I'm not going to go through the same shit I had yesterday, but I will say the same statement I started off with. Student presentations generally suck. We can all agree to that, right? It's, they're always very linear. They always go in the order that the student wants them to go in, and they dig as deep as they want, depending on what the student presenter decides they're going to do. That's generally the way it is. To, to sort of get out of that linear piece, you can certainly do something like this. You can say, what would you like to learn more about? So again, if you're in a face-to-face -face classroom, it would be so cool for a student to stand up in the front of the room and have the conference and say, I'm going to talk to you about five things. Which five would you like, which of the five would you like to speak about? And a couple of things. Kids say, well, let's talk about why make it interactive. And if you can go over a that or This could be an interactive whiteboard. And primary kids can actually come and touch what they want, which would be sort of important. So let me show you a couple of examples first. Um, here's an example of, of something that someone made in Windsor. What is your IEP IQ? Should we all know what an IEP is? So you go through here. There's a couple of instructions. I won't bore you with the instructions, but let's talk about some questions here. So parents, students over 16. Parents and students over 16 years are consulting the development and revision of the IEP. If I answer true, correct, of any revision, blah, 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 I get the idea, and you click back. What a wonderful tool this would be for educators to be able to walk through the IEP process in a pretty aimless way that a teacher, I guess, could let go of. But it would be something that a teacher could show a student how to make a team. And they're in, right? Another example would be something like this, like the life cycle of a monarch. So um, I'm a student. I want to know what happens in stage two. So I can look here and say stage two. Great. 
I know there's not a lot of information here. I know there's not a lot. But this is a great, great for me. This one is help. So they can click through whatever stage they want, and there's a bit of information on the side of what's going on. But as Kevin said yesterday, if I'm a student in the classroom, I want to be able to make some choices. I don't care what happens in the modern butterfly stage. I've seen that a million times. I want to, I'm really interested in this caterpillar so the kid can actually do this. But, so, interestingly, because we talked about that closed captioning piece, wouldn't it be cool if when you went through a presentation, a student submitted a presentation like this? Instead of submitting a presentation and you and the teacher just walk through like this, a student turns on the closed captioning, they do a screencast, they record their voice, it's all screen captioned, and the kid says, you know what, I'm in Japan because I'm for hockey, I gotta be away. Um, can you give my presentation to the class in terms of the way of a video? Or just even give them the link and I made it self-sustaining like that. So I think you get the idea of how this could work. I would encourage you again, like I said, this is a googly thing to try. Please try this, it might be cool. The last one I'll show you is this one about dinosaurs. I think it's a little I like this one just because my nephew made this. He was a very creative time. And so he gave some instructions and he said, which dinosaur would you like to learn about? So if you click on T-Rex, you learn about T-Rex a little bit, you click on the egg and you return. Oh, let's learn about a pterodactyl. Let's learn about a brontosaurus. And you get the idea. At the bottom here is a little quiz, and then that shoots them out to a form that he designed. See, I want to get some feedback and see if they actually understood what I was talking about. So again, I think what I'd like to invite you to do is try something like this. Again, please don't you go make all these things. There's a ton of these online. Find them out, share them with your students and say, if you're interested to make a little more engaging, interactive type um, presentation, be my guest. This is how you do it. And I will share some good instructions on how to do that. If you're not sure, I'm guessing, I, I'm assuming a lot of people know how to do this. Okay. The next thing I'd like to show you, and I'd like you to try this again, can you please click on that or go to that bit.ly and if you don't have a device, a phone will work here for sure. If you don't have a device, will you share with someone to make sure that you get a chance to vote for I need your email addresses. I want all your email addresses. So can you take a moment and go to that bit.ly, fill it out, take you a couple of minutes here, and then my big message is I want you to be able to try that in your classroom one day. Maybe think about how it might apply. Share with someone to make sure that you can get your email address. I want all your email addresses. If you take a moment and go to that bit, you can fill it out. Does anybody want to fill it out with minutes here? On a device? Did it work? Are you there? Is anybody there? Hey Keith, are you here right now? Do I see you Keith, somewhere? Shane, are you here? I am. Okay. Did, did, you, did you choose the right hashtag for the thing there? Are you are you on the form? I have to I can't get to it. I think some people are still going to two spaces, not to story. I'm sorry? Make sure that you, they are using story at the end. Some people are going to the old bit like that oh. gave earlier. Oh, okay. Yeah, make sure you're adding that story at the end. So bit.ly slash blended underscore story. Thanks, Eric. Did anybody successfully submit the form and then get an email back yet? No one got their email back? So just raise your hand if you get an email back would be awesome. We got an email back. Okay, good stuff. I'm just going to pop out here and show you what I'm getting in my space here. Yeah. So I'm seeing, oh, a, a number of you should be getting email back. So Jacqueline, Jennifer, Cheryl, Lori, Travis. 
step. If you haven't filled this out, this is what you're going to get. Something like this. You got an email back. So, um, little story about Glendale, Alberta. There's Nick. So Nick, Nick's colleagues are Alex, Bevan, and Lav. My biggest takeaway was being class with students. If you're a classroom model and educator, it's going to be an adult student. Yeah. So who's that person? Oh, okay. So people, I'm hoping that you can think in yourself how this might actually apply that you could use with your students here. This is pretty easy to do. If you know how to create a Google form, which I'm guessing a lot of you do, if you know how to make a Google Doc, which I know gets a lot of you know how to do, all you're doing is, is you're using an add-on called Auto Autocrat, and you're just making them speak to each other. That's all you're doing. This is not rocket science. Um, I have instructions how to create this, but again, it's not about making a little takeaway story from the blended conference here, which is about you deciding, how can I use that with my students? Maybe you have some creative students say, hey, I can do something like that, that's pretty neat. Um, the data that you receive can go into a document or it could be merged with slides. What's really cool about slides is, if 50 kids fill out the form, 50 slides are produced in the same presentation and all of their data is on an individual slide and then you can push it over slides away. It's really great if sort of crowdsourcing some stuff and collecting some cool data. So that's a neat little tool. Again, I would encourage you to try that if you get a chance. Um, I think it's a neat one. So the next thing I'd like to speak about is, is who's in control. And I loved when Catelyn spoke about this yesterday. The story I want to tell you is this. Grade seven teacher, her name is Michelle. She taught grade eight for like 20 years. And she looked at the curriculum and said, I have to teach Confederation again. She hated teaching Confederation. So this is what she did. I thought it was totally awesome. She was just on the cusp when Google Docs came out. So she was willing to give control over her kids. She taught them, she allowed them to learn Google Docs, Google Slides, Sheets and Drives. And it was a free for all awesome. So what she said was, she took the curriculum document and she posted it on the wall and said, guys, the Ministry of Education says you have to learn this. How do you want to learn that? She took an entire day for the kids to understand what the curriculum meant, what they were supposed to learn, and so on. And the class decided how they were going to learn Confederation in their own way. It was, you talk about giving control over the kids, it was unbelievable. She was scared to death. She hated Confederation, but she also hated getting the same slideshow back every year from students and getting the same 16 images and no one learning anything and kids going, oh, painted that and I'm done. So the kids took control. What they came up with, as you can imagine, as they say, as she said yesterday, the kids will blow you away. Um, what the focus took of the class was, they said, how about we do this? How about, instead of talking about confederation in a bubble and the way it was in Canada, how about we talk about the way other nations formed their governments throughout history? So many students took different lines of, of, of attack here. These particular girls made a presentation about, um, their presentation was about the history of Canadian women compared to the history of women in Pakistan and leadership roles they took in those areas. So these grade eight students talked about not only the forming of the government, but what was the role of women in the forming of government in Canada compared to Pakistan. And it was pretty compelling what the timelines looked like. And they, and other kids had different countries they compared. They didn't all do the same thing about women in politics, but it was awesome where the kids took it. And they, of course, as you can imagine, made some connections with people in Pakistan. It was really, really, really well done when the kids took this. I love this idea. But the whole idea of who's in control, I think we have to maybe take a look at it and say, if I want, some great learning in my class, it's not a bad thing to have the kids be in control sometimes about where they take that learning because they're going to do some good stuff. Um, before I move on, I will say this. We talk about students controlling things. This is a great quote from what Catelyn had in a recent blog post. She said, being a student in a student centered classroom is hard, and some kids just don't want to work that hard. People, we recognize this, and I'm sure you all recognize this. The people who struggle the most in those classrooms are your 90 students. They're used to getting 90s and they're great at getting 90s because they say, can you just shut up and tell me what to do to get my 90 and I will do that. You know, this is a true story and we'll tell you this. I had really high grades in math in high school 
because I figured out the game really early. Every week the teacher came in, they put the homework on the board, and they took up the homework, they gave me a couple practice, and it's more work. So listen to what I did. I, I'm telling you this honestly. I told the teacher I did this two years later. I'd walk into class and I'd look at the list of homework and say, Sir, I didn't get 5A last night. Can you go through 5A, please? So and inevitably he would say, You know, 5A wasn't really that important. How about we do 6E? So he did 6E in the board. I listened when he did 6E. He thought I was doing my homework. I was learning the important stuff. And what do you think was on the test the next week? 6E. So I got graded at 6 E. I didn't, wasn't good at that. I got good at the prescription he showed me on the board. But that's what it was, right? So when I got to classes where the teacher all of a sudden said, no, you've got to learn and you've got to problem solve and stuff, it wasn't for me. I was great at getting 90s in classes where teachers gave me prescriptions. And then when I got to teaching, I thought, I'm not going to teach that way. I want to try to get kids to learn at an equal level. And I will tell you honestly, the first two months of my class, I struggled. They struggle big time because they are not used. They are very much not used to learning in that direction. They want the prescription. They want to just say, here's what you have to do and give me my nine. Give me the algorithm. So what does it look like? Um, in Ontario, we use, I didn't say we use. It's not very used that much. The Ministry of Education has contracted D2L for bright space for every student and every teacher in Ontario. Big money as you can imagine. The usage is not great. There are some pockets that are amazing and actually used in a great way. There are some pockets that have never heard of it. So when I would go into class from six or seven years after the contract, they didn't even know what they were talking about, which is really unfortunate. It's just it's too bad that it wasn't sort of a bigger piece there. Let me show you a couple of things about sort of making a student-centered classroom. And of course, I think you all have the ability to translate this into or transcend this into movie. So this is what a class looks like in, in here. And there's a couple of places here that may not be really obvious, but the whole goal is, can the students see themselves in here? Can they see themselves in this classroom? So a couple of things. Um, here's one way they can see themselves. We work today on that blended space there. That's an embedded slideshow there, which I'm sure a lot of you do. When the student puts their work in there, they'll say, oh, I wonder if my little thing came out. That's the first place they'll go. They'll go and look. Is it, did anyone ever run the yearbook at their high school? They'll run the yearbook? <laughs> When a kid comes up to you and says, the yearbook was great, miss, what did that really mean? They were in the yearbook nine times. They played a pass for everything else, right? The yearbook sucked, miss. They weren't in the yearbook. It's about them. They want to be in stuff. So right here, if a kid says, they go, okay, I can go here and say, oh, they, I, that's my stuff right there. The person with this little graphic there is a police right now because their graphic is showing. Right? So that's one way, I guess, of creating a, a, a place where at least the students can see themselves a little bit. I'm guessing embedding a slideshow is something you all can do, and, and you're good. Google Drawings really, really embed beautifully. If I can say one thing about differentiated instruction, which I think is big, you may notice that the only piece that shows when you embed stuff is the actual workspace itself. So if you think about this, if you put stuff off the workspace like we did with those sticky notes, you can differentiate instruction beautifully where student A might need those prompts on the side and I can give you some of the stuff to scaffold your learning in there. Student B might need nothing and just give them a blank one. You can give them different slideshows, but the result that's showing there would only be what is actually on the workspace. So you can really scaffold that learning beautifully for your students that need that extra support. Um, another area here is, is, is posting something like this. So again, social media, so I'm posting links to B's blog, Jesse's Instagram, and so on. That's sort of a, a no-brainer that put that on there. The kids can always go navigate to each other's stuff, and then it's all there. Again, they're seeing themselves, right? A great tool in Brightspace, and please don't think you have, you know, a lot of, a lot of things have this. I'm not sure if Google has this or not. Um, another area here is a glossary tool in Brightspace, which is really cool the way they've done this. You can change some permissions and allow the students to contribute to the glossary. So, a little bit of control issues there. It's all recorded. It's dangerous because the kids will erase stuff and they'll write inappropriate things. So be it. But what I love about this is um, this item was contributed by Amy Rollins. The date was September 2019. If a student wants to go to add to that, they can add to it and then say, This was modified by whomever on October 10th. And you've got this thing where 
it's, it's a great assessment opportunity, for sure, because students are contributing to the class rate, but at the same time, it's something that they can see themselves in when they arrive here. They can actually see themselves, I was the one that did this. If I'm a grade five kid, and I have some control over my learning environment, I'm going home and showing someone at home that I did that. Hey, mom and dad, look, I'm in, I'm in there. It's my name in there. Other than just the class list, right? You'll notice there's an FAQ section. It's sort of the same idea, but students can ask questions. Again, you can make it so that students can contribute and add and modify and delete. And you can lock that down if you have to. Yesterday, it was suggested about the, the uh, in one of the sessions we saw there was a checklist tool. I just want to show you this because I think it really talks about sort of student agency. Um, I'll preview this because I'm not in as, as a student. This is what it looks like. It's really, really well done, the checklist tool. The checklist tool in this, and, and again, it doesn't have to be a tool in the course. You can probably use some hack from somewhere else. You can create a checklist in Google or something. But what I love about this is it actually links to parts of the course. So I've done that. And if you click there, it will link to the piece of content called Investigating Quadratics. It's a great way to teach the kids to sort of monitor what they're doing. It can be printed. It can just be used digitally. Every time they update the checklist, it gets saved and it says when they saved it. Generally, there's no um, evaluation attached to this or assessment, but students do use it often. I, I know when I teach a few courses, they love the checklist tool. They might print it off at the start, but a lot of them just use it sort of in a digital format. The checklist tool is very, very nice. In terms of interactivity, a couple of things that you can do that, which can make your course a little bit more interactive. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you have heard of Edpuzzle. Maybe you raise your hand if you've never heard of Edpuzzle. Okay, Edpuzzle is a really brilliant tool. Um, I'm pretty sure I can make this up the screen. What functions are and how you can tell us what makes a function. So what Edpuzzle is, is a, is a tool that allows you to connect to a YouTube video, find yourself a YouTube video. It's all, you know, just the cards and stuff on YouTube. I didn't make this video. But what it allows you to do is, it allows you to put little nodes along here where the student is required to stop and answer a question. And all of that data is recorded if you've created a class and you can see that if the student got it there. So it's somewhat active learning in that sense. If I scroll over here a little bit, I'll show you what happens. Um, play it here. So this one is not a function. It allows you to put a little node on here. Right. That was over here. And also what happens is it stops and it asks the kids a question. What about the relation on the right? Is it a function? Yes, no. You get, I'm sure you get the idea, you could have multiple choice, you could have fill the blank, you could have open response questions. All of those things are recorded. They're assessed if they're sort of multiple choice type questions, and you can assess sort of the open response ones if you need to. What a wonderful tool. Again, students need to make these. Imagine a student creating a video and then putting it in that puzzle and having momentary checks throughout the process where they're actually checking to see the understanding of the audience that they're using. Again, the whole idea here, we're trying to make the learning environment a little bit interactive if we can, which is sort of cool. Um, let me skip over the content and show you something else which is sort of interactive. So I like this. This is a lesson on investigating quadratics. Sarah, please don't yell at me. I didn't use a template, but I used black and white text. Okay. So I'm investigating quadratics. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop out to Desmos. Um, just before I move on here, is there anybody in the room that has not heard about Desmos? People, if you're a math teacher, even if you're not a math teacher, this is like, this is unbelievable to me. If you're not a math teacher, or even if you're a teacher, you've probably seen the TI-83s. You know the big case the kid the teacher would carry around? They cost about 120 bucks each. They're brutal. The batteries always get corroded. The kids don't know how to use them and so on. They now have an online version of a, of a graphing document. So when I learned quadratics, the teacher would take four boards and draw two graphs, and you could just go to sleep and wait till the end. I can literally mess around with this here. It gives you sliders to say, oh, I wonder if I change the A value. Oh, I get it, the shape changes. Oh, look, check that out. Oh, and I can oh, the shape can change, it just moves. Think of the investigative nature of this type of tool that kids can do here. They can share the document, they can send it to the teacher, they can take screenshots. This is an amazing tool. People, if, even if you're not a math person, like Saturday night, this is what I am doing. Really, <laughs> right here, my wife, oh, 
I'm just kidding. Um, anyway, that's Desmos. So the student goes in and does some investigation. Another wonderful tool, if you haven't heard of this, is something called H5P. So as someone said in a session yesterday, the kids don't read content. Kids go to the content, they search through one of the assignments, and they try to read the assignment. Correct? So generally, that's what adults do, so why wouldn't students do it? This is really neat. This is not d 2 l stuff. This is an embedded piece from something called H5P. How many of you have heard of H5P? Cool. Well, oh, look at that. It's all on that side of the room. So people, if you haven't used H5P, please investigate it. It allows you to create interactive things that are just one-offs for students. So if I go here and say the practical will open, and I'll say it'll open it's not well stuff. The A value affects the shape of the parabola. And oh, I don't get this. If I click over here, this is, is it narrow or they want the word narrow or wider? Great. And I think you could, you could probably build yourself a little interactive with that. When you're done, you can check. And it gives you right answers, wrong answers. Every time a kid opens D2L, it's a new instance of the H5P little embedded little thing. And the student gets to do a self check as they go along. So instead of just saying, I'm going to show you a video, read this content, I'm making sure you get all this, how about a stop gap to say, let's do this? It's not just fill in the blank, it's drag and drop, it's probably 30, 40 different types of interactives that you can make with students. What's totally awesome about it is it's embedded inside of there and it's shareable. So as a group of teachers, get your science teachers together, make 20 of them, and then share them in all of your courses. If the embed code changes from the other end, everybody changes in everybody's course. It's totally awesome. It's a great, great tool, H5P. What you will be pleased to know is that H5P um, now is connecting with Blackboard, and it's going to be, I don't know what the word is, um, it's an LTI integration. So Blackboard and Moodle are now connected with this, as you can see, is, is, is Brightspace. Moodle and H5P, I'm sorry. Moodle and H5P of an H, H or a, an integration. I believe it may be paid right now, but it's, it's down the road, obviously, it's become part of the learning management system. It's an amazing tool. If you have to investigate H5P, please take a moment and find that. I think you'll really like that. Um, questions, comments so far? Does anyone want to say anything? Okay. Can I talk about Google Classroom for a second? I think what happened in Ontario was probably reflected what was happening in a lot of schools out west here. Teachers have discovered Google Classroom and they think it's the panacea, it's all they use. It is literally the best tool in the world. It is a very powerful tool. Essentially what it does is, is it takes all of your Google stuff and it manages it for you. Right? So think before Google Classroom what people did was they made folders, they shared them with students, Folder per kid every year, they made new folders, they shared with students, they unshared with students. It got really unwieldy, right? Your, your mail with the notifications went nuts. It was absolutely crazy what happened. Google Classroom is really just a really fancy distribution system. I think the power of it exists, and where we saw yesterday in a lot of the sections we were in, excuse me, it gives you that ability to go into a student's assignment and provide that real live on time feedback. I don't know where that is otherwise. I think that the ability to go into a student's document live and give feedback is probably the best feature all of you use in your practice right now. So should you be using Google Classroom? Absolutely you should be using Google Classroom. If you have Moodle, have a little link to it because that's where the kids are going to create and you're going to give feedback and they're going to give that feedback loop with each other and so on. That's a great, great tool. But I think at some point, you may need an LMS to do other things like embedding H5P and doing things where students are submitting assignments and tracking them for you. I don't think there'll ever be a time when Google Classroom will be able to allow you to submit grades to the office. I think Moodle and Brightspace do have that ability at some point. Maybe it's, I think maybe Moodle doesn't, but I know Brightspace is very, very close to being a great management system as well. But please, if you have an embraced Google Classroom, by all means, jump on that one. Um, short video. I'm married, so I'm allowed to show you this video. Okay? If you're not married, if you're in any sort of relationship, I think you'll get this. Can you turn it way up, Doug? Very good. 
where it's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And I don't know if this is going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that's most, but I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Do you have a nail in your head? Yeah. It's not about the nails. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if you got that out of there. Stop trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that the nail is causing You always do this. You always try to fix things when what it really means for you to just listen. See, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail. See, you're not listening now. Okay, fine. I'll right, listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. <laughs> and I was thinking about all the um, um, sweaters and snacks between all of them. <laughs> Come on, if you would just tell <laughs> Anyway, so um, I think what I want to say to you with that is that the importance of communication, of course, is sort of key in a, in a classroom, right? I just love that video, and I, again, I'm sorry if it, it, it hurt me feelings, I just think it's very true. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> can you read that character there? <laughs> I think sometimes that's going on, right? So, I would suggest to you that in your discussion boards and your Moodle sometimes, a lot of you don't use discussions because that's what you think you're getting back, right? If you've taken an AQ course, participated in one, the dreaded discussion was huge. You hated discussions because this was the instruction, right? Please res make, craft your own response and reply to at least two of your classmates. It was like you, it was like you had to say that. Why can't it do something a little bit different? Um, I went to this was groundbreaking for me. I saw this presentation about six years ago. This girl's name was Beth Renee Ropnack. She's from um, the University of West Georgia. It was a virtual session, and she talked about how to re-engage students in online discussions in a way that's actually effective. So please don't please know that these aren't my ideas, but I love sharing because I just think it's great. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm not standing here telling you that any of this stuff is really mine. I'm just sharing stuff. So um, that's really the point, right? Is it really is it much new knowledge out there? Not really sure. We call she calls them the dreaded discussions. You think of it as a teacher, all those things in the left, you're gonna go and you're gonna read all those. You have it right. You don't go read all those. The students don't go and read all those, right? What she suggests is is something what she calls a real discussion. And it's sort of a subtle thing. In the previous slide, when they're all lined up like that, there's some little tiny threads inside of there where you have no idea what's going on inside the discussion. It's really an ugly way of looking at things. In here, you can sort of set a little indent, and the discussion sort of just goes on. Think in a classroom. You would never say, hey, students, in a face-to-face -face classroom, I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to ask you all the same question, and ask you all to reply to me in one way. That's not a conversation. That's a, I don't know what that is. It's certainly not a discussion. So the deal is, she says, this is what I want you to do. My questions are here to guide and inspire the instruction. So I'll, at the risk of making you not read that, I'll tell you what she does. The teacher posts the first post. So she makes the first post in the discussion form. The next student that comes in is required to reply to her post. And she has to use one of the ideas in her post and just in a, in a touchy feely sort of way, she says, please use my name when you're referring to my voice from a personal skill, I guess. The next student, if they're crafty at all, will respond to the first two posts in some way, but can actually continue the conversation. And it becomes a real conversation as opposed to just putting in time and no one reads and repeats stuff. I think the key piece that she suggests is to have a rubric. And the rubric spells out what I'm looking for in these things. What's cool is she doesn't assess them. She provides feedback to them, but she provides she assesses nothing in the discussion. So there's no mark attached to it. I don't even know how you do that. I found myself one day. I was sitting there before this thing, but a month before, I was making a rubric and I was saying, 
two replies would be a level one, three replies would be a level four. And I thought, am I really writing this down? I'm going to get, I'm going to sit here and count these. It was, I was so scared of having a discussion, but then I saw her presentation, I was so happy. She was awesome. So, um, this is what she writes, and it's, she's, she's very well spoken, but she just, it's very inviting in her classroom. And, and I'll let you read it on your own later, but I love the idea that you're not, you are not assessing this, uh, you're just being inspired to say you participate in a real conversation. Uh, there's a great video she has, it's about six minutes, she calls it a sizzle video. And she explains it all to you, and it's awesome. And we'll share that with you. This is what she writes. Another kind of discussion, if you're interested, because you're all Google people, you don't like using the Google stuff. This is another kind of discussion you can use, which I think is sort of cool. I'll show you sort of in this format. So what you do is, is you create slides for each people. So for instance, you might see something like this, where um, this is Rachel's ideas, and these are responses to Rachel. So they're all sort of live in a Google Doc. Everyone has access to it. You set it up ahead of time, or you can ask them to do it if you want. Now, here's your slide where you're going to have your ideas. There's going to be an accompanying slide where people can reply to you, and then they can see it in real time. What's nice is in Google Classroom, you can look at all this, and you can sort of see when no one's getting responses. And maybe ask the kids to do this. Listen, no one's replying to Susie. Can you put something for her? And then all of a sudden, it becomes very equitable, and everybody's getting responses to what they want. So that's another option if you would like. Certainly, I would encourage you to think about that one. So, okay, so I have I have the idea of what's next. We just saw Desmos. I read this tweet, I believe it was October 18th. So it's, it's really happening. North Carolina students will be allowed to use Desmos graphing calculators on their end of course and final exams. I'm barely waiting to share the news with my students tomorrow. People, I think of where we come from in the math world where is using a calculator a good thing or a bad thing? Kids be allowed to use calculators to do these things. Calculators now have functions that are out of this world, right? They can have fractions for God's sake. And they come up there. They can do, there's CAS calculators that can actually solve quadratic equations for you, right? So teachers are saying, well, I can't apply these things to that. Well, what are they learning here, right? When I see that, this just warms my heart to think. This is where we're going with this stuff. And I, and I think of when I used to first train teachers, I said to the teachers, you realize one day, you're gonna be standing in front of the room and every kid in front of you is going to have a Chromebook. And that's really the case right now in a lot of places. Those teachers were panicking. What are, what are we gonna do? Well, there's nothing to do with that. There was close points. Who has control? Well, you do, you can tell them to close them. Teachers go in and say, we go into Mr. Johnson's class, doesn't let us do the Chromebooks. Why not? Well, we're cheating. We're not, not listening. We're not listening to him. Probably because Mr. Johnson was talking the whole class, and the kids got tired of listening to him. When I see this, I just think it's great. But I just think to myself, if I'm a teacher, I'm looking towards the future. I better be able to deal with this. That they're going to be able to use those types of devices on final exams and on assessments. Where, so can I ask the kid to graph it now? I don't know. Can I ask the kid to make a graph? I'm not really sure because now they can just make one here. Maybe a higher level question is. Let's talk about the meaning of that graph, and let's talk about how that graph can apply in a situation and so on, which is probably a lot more powerful than the kid making the graph. Right? Um, just to show you this graphic. So, last day of homeschool, the kid runs out of any. It's all that right. Um, I guess there's a lot of homeschool people. There's a lot of homeschool things happening here. Yeah. Um, I think we. I, the reason I put this much is because I thought, I'm so pleased over the last couple of days to see the people that are making this sort of engaging. When, you know, let's face it, a lot of the students that are doing the homeschool and the outreach programs are sometimes, you know, at-risk students and they're, and they're students that need sort of to make that an engaging, welcoming, uh, building relationship sort of place. And so, you know, I think when people run on the last day of school say so they're happy, it's because it's older, but you want kids to enjoy school. Yes, right? Hopefully. Love this quote. Um, so when we're talking about what's next, I think I want to take the advice of a lot of people in the last few days. It would be great if we could do more of that stuff. Publish your work on a blog. Publish your work on a website. When Catherine yesterday said all the kids had public facing websites, I thought that was awesome. One of the caveats I used to say to my teachers was just build it out slowly. Have a blog, but have only the kids in the class attached to the blog. And then maybe invite the parents in. And then go worldwide at some point. It doesn't have to be all in one day. 
one of her messages yesterday was be patient. Yeah, absolutely be patient. But still ask them to publish stuff and their work will be incredible, right? Um, I was thinking of Shane yesterday, we gave a presentation, I wasn't lucky enough to be in it, but Shane, you were from the faculty of Ed and you were giving a presentation about uh, sort of um, your placements there and so on, they should be having that kind of stuff. So just to share with you about maybe what a teaching career might look like, I will tell you honestly, I want to send letters of apology to the first eight or nine years of kids that I taught. Because I was so bad. I look back and I look at the quizzes and the stuff I gave. You're horrible. You're absolutely horrible in spiritual pursuit. And, and you're trying the hardest you've ever tried. So in that first part, you have inflated expectations, absolutely you do. Then you get to that trough of disillusionment where kids aren't handing stuff in, they're not getting it. I will tell you honestly, it took me about eight or nine years where I said to my wife, I think the kids are actually learning this stuff now. But prior to that, they weren't getting it. Now, did I let the kids down? Possibly. This is what saved me, was the passion for my teaching career was always there. I was way up there. I loved teaching. I taught for 31 years. I was in education. The day I left it, I was tired. I felt like I just started because I loved it so much. So when I hear some of the comments, people saying, they're curious about this and so on. They love, you know, the comment in the, in the Twitter profile. Um, I'm thinking of Terry who says, why am I retiring? I love this too much. This is incredible. And it's so true that the passion is something you have to keep. Now, the last thing I'm going to share with you is there's a little bit of fear because you're all going to go back to your school boards and maybe work with people. And again, you're the leaders in technology. You're going to be working with people that are going to start new technology in their classrooms. They're scared. And they say, I don't want it. There's privacy issues. Seth Golden put out this thing. This is so funny because it's I think it was nine years old, but I think it's really So the last one to share with you is this is two minutes long. There's a little bit of 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 a you know, if you, if you spend time with, with technically connected 15 year olds, you're going to discover a bunch of things. First of all, many of them don't watch any television whatsoever, but they consume more videos. It's um, and, and most of them are not concerned whatsoever about Dunbar's number and this notion that they only have 150 friends and family, or else their brain melts. Um, they have a thousand people that they're connected with, or 5,000 people, and they are living a life out loud. And some people are responding to that by saying, I don't care, I'll put up pictures of me drinking on my funnel and I will, you know, act up it's in the world, I'm just gonna do it and that's fine. And others, and I'm very lucky to the two of them, are saying, Wow, what a chance for me to contribute to the circle and to organize to the circle. That here's a stage and I'm not gonna put on a play. But I am going to organize something that is, you know, helping to build something like the Habitat for Humanity or putting a, a technical innovation into the world. And so, as parents, we're often pushed to make this choice. And the choice is to keep your kids out of the connection world and isolate them and make sure they're, quote, safe, unquote. Or push your kids into the world and, you know, all hell will break loose. Those are the things that they talk about at the PTA meeting. And I don't know if that's the choice. I think the choice is everyone is in the world now. Everyone is connected. You cannot keep your 12 year olds from hearing profanity. You can't get over it. But given that they're in the world, what trail are they going to leave? What mark are they leaving? Are they doing it just to get into college? Or are they doing it because they understand that their role as a contributor to society starts now when they're 10, not when they're 24? Mm -hmm. And that the trail they leave behind starts the minute someone snaps the picture. Mm -hmm. And if we can teach children that there isn't this bright line between off duty and on duty, but that life is life and you ought to live it like people are looking at you because they are, then we trust them. And we trust them to be bigger than they could be because they choose to be bigger. And it's that teaching, I think that is so difficult to do as a parent because what you really want to do is protect them and lock them up until it's time. But the greatest thing to do is have these free-range kids who are exploring 
the edges of the universe, but do it in a way that they're proud of, not hiding from you. So thank you for listening to that. Again, I will share all the stuff with you. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I finished on time, I believe, Terry. So we're good. Thanks, everyone.